I will address the elephant in the room. And I did get my hair cut. I was in desperate need, but I was saying earlier that um, as of um, as of this time, uh, two days ago, Samuel and I had the same haircut, but his just looks so much better. And I don't know if it has something to do with the blonde curls and the ruddy cheeks or what, but, you know, he's just, uh, he can get away with that and I can't. So anyway, guys, we really appreciate y'all being here with us tonight. I am going to make a concerted effort to repeat y'all's comments and questions for the sake of our streaming audience. Several people have politely, and I will emphasize politely, have politely asked me, hey, could you uh, be sure to repeat those comments and questions? I do reserve the right. If your comment is ridiculous, I'm kidding. <laughs> I won't do that. But um, <clears throat> I will, uh, I will, yeah, that's, I, I am, I have no qualms about uh, censorship and <laughs> no, we, uh, we will have, uh, we'll have a good time tonight. And so I'll be sure to repeat the question. So if I, I apologize if, if I'm talking over you or if I'm literally repeating what you just told me, <laughs> it's not for you. It's for our friends online. So anyway, guys, appreciate y'all joining us tonight. Let's turn to first Kings, first Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12. And for those who are on Facebook and YouTube, I will post that here. First Kings chapter 12. We'll start in verse 1. <clears throat> Show of hands, how many of you, uh, how many of your favorite book is favorite book in the Bible is First Kings? For those of you who are streaming online, you probably want to know that literally everyone raised, no, no one raised their hands. First Kings, okay, man. So, last uh, couple of quarters ago, I taught a class called Exploring Our Strange Bible. And I think I asked the question, show of hands, who prefers the Old Testament? And I don't think a single person raised their hand. Not even, not even somebody just to be contrary. <laughs> Or to be different or unique. So anyway, all right. First Kings chapter twelve. Let's let's read together. And I'll I'll, I'll read for the again for the sake of our uh, folks who are streaming. Now Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Now that could mean literally every single person in Israel, or it could mean representatives of all of Israel. So, when Jeroboam son of Nebat heard of it, for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon. Then Jeroboam returned from Egypt, and they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the, and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Now your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us, and we will serve you. And he said to them, Go away for three days and then come again to me. So the people went away. We're in First Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12, starting in verse 6 here in just a second. So the idea of them in verse 5, to go away for three days, basically uh, Rehoboam needs time to convene with his counselors. That's essentially what's happening here. Go away for three days could, again, literally mean three days, or it could mean you know, take a weekend off, we'll get back to you on Monday, okay? So starting in 1 Kings 12, verse 6, then King Rehoboam took counsel with the older men who had attended his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, Well, how do you advise me to answer this people? They answered him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he disregarded the advice that the older men gave him and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him and now attended him. He said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus you should say to this people who spoke to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you must lighten it for us. Thus you should say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Whew. Yikes. Okay. Do you know how this story ends? What happens 
to the rest of the story. What's what's the deal here? What happens? It is rebellion. It is rebellion. What happens to the kingdom of Israel after this point? It's split. It's split. And it didn't even divide evenly in two. It's split pretty ugly. Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Yeah. Basically, what Rehoboam promises to do is all the things that generations earlier Samuel said kings would do to the Israelites way back in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Show of hands, whose favorite book is 1 Samuel? Not a single soul. Okay, man. All right. I've got a book that I'm going to use for a class. The book is entitled The Old Testament is Dying. And it's about what to do about why people don't like the Old Testament. Anyway, coming to a class near you at some point in 2022 or 2023. Just stay tuned. Come to my classes and you'll see what we're teaching about. First Samuel chapter 8. First Samuel chapter 8. I'll uh, post this down here in the chat. We're going to turn to First Samuel chapter 8. We'll start in verse 4. Yeah, Adrian, uh, Adrian is uh, on, online with us. The Old Testament is getting no love tonight. You got that right. Uh, Bet, gl I'm glad you found us here. Yeah, Bet says on Facebook, I found Wednesday night. Carol, I don't know why you said boo. Maybe it's because of my, I'll, I, I'll say it's because you don't like my haircut. We'll say, we'll say that's what it is. Carol hopped on. The first thing she said was boo. Maybe it was, she was surprising me, greeting me. Boo. Yeah. We'll, we'll say it was either that or uh, you preferred my wild man look. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. Basically, what uh, Rehoboam is promising to do is all the things that, happens in this conversation. <clears throat> then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, you are old. <laughs> Woo. It, uh, we thought it was a little dicey in here earlier today. <laughs> You're old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Okay, so they're, they're at least being practical here. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they govern us. You can almost hear, you can almost hear Mark behind that. Give us a king to govern us. We want a king. Samuel prayed to the Lord, verse 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to the voice only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. And he said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and to equip uh, and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them and to his work. He will take one tenth of your flocks and so you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out, because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. What is the rest of the story? We want a king. <laughs> Sign us up. That sounds like a great deal. Wow. Basically, Rehoboam's threats to do essentially this, to do essentially what Samuel said. Hey, these guys are going to do this. Watch out. They're going to do this. Rehoboam's threats lead to the division of the kingdom. All right, now let's speculate for a moment. Going back to uh, 1 Kings 12. You can turn there if you want to. What do you think the significance is of Rehoboam ignoring the wise advice of his father's elders and heeding the rash advice of his peers? Do you think it's significant that the writer of 1 Kings points out 
that Rehoboam ignores the advice of the elders and instead listens to the, vi the advice of his friends. Is there something significant to that? Is there some subtle critique here? What do you think? Let's speculate for a moment. What do you think? Don't know how young Rehoboam was, but it's possible. Yeah. These these guys were faithful to my dad, but guess what? I'm not my dad. I'm going to do things the way I want to do things. Yeah. Rehoboam was 41, so he was only five years older than me. Definitely sounds like Rehoboam did not pray for wisdom like his father. I I kind of think that there might be some there might be some subtle critique. Here's just one small thing. And hey, by the way, you know, according to the author of Kings, he's probably subtly including this detail. Here's one small way in which Rehoboam's reign started off on the wrong foot. And oh, by the way, it's, it's not going to get much better later on. There's the comment was. The comment was the dangers of was pointing out the uh, for for the sake of people listening here, yeah. The yeah the for the, again for those uh, streaming the comment was about the dangers of putting the young and inexperienced in, maybe in over their heads. Yeah, I think that's fair. S <laughs> he, he at least Rehoboam was at least willing to hear what they had to say and then he decided yeah I don't care about you guys anyway it appears that these uh, basically what it seems like is you have these cooler level-headed elders versus their hot-headed younger counterparts yeah It could be a power play. It, it could be a way to for Rehoboam to say, I, I, I'm going to throw my weight around here. Yes, sir. Ooh, a little bit of peer pressure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Rehoboam, are you going to let them talk to you like that? Yeah, that could be. Oh, man. And young, you know, 41-year-olds who have something to prove. I mean, you know. Rehoboam's brand new in his career as king. He's got, he's got something to prove, maybe. Yeah. I think you can make the argument that, at least to some degree, there was a breakdown. I think you can make this argument. That there was a breakdown of intergenerational relationships in Israel's leadership. The younger, less experienced rulers were quick to resort to violence. Perhaps, perhaps to cover up for their general lack of authority in the eyes of the people. I, I think it's okay for us to read between the lines here a little bit and see that. I know we're going to switch gears just a bit, but I'm going to ask a question that might seem unrelated, but trust me, it is. What is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it? Honor your father and mother. What is the promise that is attached to that commandment? That you might live long in the land. Friends, let's turn to Exodus chapter 20. Show, quick show of hands. Whose favorite book is Exodus? Man, Adrian was right again. The Old Testament's getting no love tonight. But that's why we're here. Uh, Adrian asked a question here. In verse 10 in the ESV, it mentions that the younger group of men had grown up with him. That's correct. Yeah, it seems like these guys were his peers, maybe um, maybe kind of longtime friends. 
Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's this year. Oh, um, you know what is getting some love is my haircut. Thanks, Bet and Easter Bell. Appreciate you guys uh, doing this on Facebook. I don't even think my wife has commented to, on uh, on this yet. So, you know, but she's seen it. Um, so anyway, yeah, Exodus chapter twenty, verse twelve. Exodus chapter twenty, verse twelve. <clears throat> This is not a long passage. It's honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. If you notice, I mean, this is right. This is the first commandment with a promise. There are other, you know, there are other additional explanations about things in the previous commandments, but there's not, this is the first one that says, do this, and on the basis of you doing that, this thing will result. Okay. In this context, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, in this context, what does the word honor mean? At a very basic level, yeah, Randall said, it, take care of them financially. More broadly, something like respect, which would naturally include something like taking care of them financially. Yeah, absolutely. Obedience, yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, it, essentially, as, as long as the... Okay, how many of y'all remember the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Okay, yeah. As long as the paterfamilias, right? <laughs> as long as the head of the household is still alive and functioning. It, it is essentially his family. And then when he passes on, it traditionally would go to the oldest son to be the head of the family, something along those lines. Generally, that was the case. Anybody else? Uh, just uh, Those are correct answers, uh, uh, but I'm interested. What else do you say? What does it mean to honor one's parents in this context? Hold them in high regard. That's right. Yeah. You might think it you know, might mean something like listening to them, <laughs> holding their opinions in high regard. Ooh, not criticizing them to others. Yeah. Oof. I, I, am, I am not always perfect in this. Surprise. <laughs> but I have a personal policy that says I... Do not say anything about someone that you would not say to them. And that forces me, even if I have a legitimate criticism of how someone's behaving or something along those lines, that forces me to choose my words carefully to honor this person. Most of the people that I interact with are Christians, so it's usually the case is to honor this person as a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe, maybe a brother or sister in error, right? But a brother or sister nonetheless. And so to be to, to be careful with what I say about them, not to criticize them. Yes, sir. Probably also some of the pitfalls uh, that they would fall into by disobeying would come back on the parents. Mm, very true. So the the children's disobedience would reflect negatively on the parents. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That uh, what a way to how many of you were told not to do something because our family doesn't do that? <laughs> That's essentially a code of honor, right? Yeah, the Barker says don't do that, Dorisa. You need to get it together. <laughs> don't tell her I said that. <laughs> She's heard it a few times. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would. I don't remember being told. You know, well, the birds don't do that. But there were things that I understood that, that we don't do. Yeah, and, and that's just how it is. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Essentially, I think honor, you know, the idea of respect and love, and, and that's such a big deal because of, of of what John just told us. Yeah, of like that can come back on on the family, and if you have generations that are constantly cutting each other down, well, you're going to run into big trouble. This quote is a little lengthy. But it's from a nice commentary on the Old Testament that I like. It's, it's a commentary that talks about uh, just some of the backgrounds, whether it's 
you know, social or historical backgrounds or religious backgrounds and things like that. And it talks about, uh, in this particular verse, it says, the home was seen as an important and necessary link for the covenant instruction of each successive generation. Who is responsible for passing down the covenant and the covenant instruction? It's the parents to pass on down to their, gen their kids and then their kids to pass down to their kids and so on. Honor is given to parents as representatives of God's authority for the sake of covenant preservation. You know, your parents, and again, the, the assumption in this verse is that your parents are honorable. I can't tell you how many times I've been in Bible classes and we've somebody has cited honor your father and mother, and immediately the question is, well, what about when your parents are despicable? It's like, okay, man, really? Like, yeah, I get that that happens, but... I have to tell my five-year-old this sometimes. I'll give him a rule, and then he'll try to start listing off all the exceptional times of when he doesn't have to follow that rule. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> just understand the rule first. Just understand the rule first. That's how the Ten Commandments work. The quote keeps going, if parents are not heeded or their authority is repudiated, the covenant's in jeopardy. In this connection, notice that the commandment comes with a covenant promise, living long in the land. In the ancient Near East, it's not religious heritage, but the fabric of society. So not just something more small, something smaller like religious heritage. It's a whole fabric of society that's threatened when there's no respect for parental authority and filial obligations are neglected. Your obligations as a child, if you neglect that, I don't know, essentially the whole fabric of society breaks down. Some of them were, you know, counting every little uh, tenth of a of a, an herb to give to God, but they were not. They were sure their responsibility toward their parents. Exactly. Yeah. Jesus. Uh, Cheryl said uh, Jesus roasts the Pharisees for how they will tithe down to the tiniest little grain, but they refuse to honor their parents by providing for them the way that they ought to. Yeah. Very true. Very true. All right. What is the value of listening to people older and more experienced than you? Wisdom, Wisdom and experience, right? Yeah. Wisdom experience. Ideally, you would be less likely to make mistakes. Either you will know a model to follow or you'll know what things not to do, right? <laughs> Because they have already made those mistakes. That is absolutely right. Glenn, did you have a comment? Okay. I don't know if your hand was just blowing in the wee, in the breeze or not. You could... Good business practice. I work at oil field. There's more liquid that's going to get. It's not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Yeah. Everybody, sometimes you throw an idea. Ten minutes later, it might not seem as good. You get some more comments. Right. I guess... I, as an example, what well, the vertex here, the bottles come up, I use a certain plug and it'll work down home and spin up my well. That's a problem. I came up with a better idea, and the drilling engineer came up with a, a better idea. Mm -hmm. What we did is it worked, and, and the manager said, That's how you get things done. Yeah. So get together, throw ideas out. Yeah. The, this is. Everybody's experience. Mm hmm. That's right. Yeah. So for, again, people listening here, the comment was essentially you know, from, from experience in the oil field, learning how to build off of each other's ideas in order to find the thing that does the job. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think another reason why it's, why there's value in listening, especially to older and more experienced people than you is it's humbling. It's humbling to me, because I have to, by seeking the knowledge of others, essentially I'm admitting that, hey, I don't have all the answers. You know, I might have a, a shiny degree, but man, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. You need to be willing to. <clears throat> right. But actually being open to listen and and, and to you know, pay them the compliment of being willing to, well, I guess, treat them like how you would want your idea to be treated, right? If you are willing to put yourself out there. Now, let me ask the flip side of that question. 
What is the value of listening to people younger than you? Could get a different perspective? Yeah. Is Maybe I should ask, is there any value in listening to people younger than you? Room got kind of quiet. <laughs> I say that as the youngest person in the room teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You get a different perspective. Anybody else? Different people have different experiences, so I, I don't think it's necessarily right simply ask if that person is older than me and younger than me to decide whether or not they have anything of value that I might benefit from. Yeah. It's more do they have experiences that I haven't had. Yeah. And so the that that's a really just a, kind of a, a fair and neutral way to present it, regardless of one's age. The difference in experience can lend to a broader perspective, and maybe to cover one of your blind spots, and vice versa. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, very much so. The value again, once again, seeing the value of others. They, um, especially, especially the well, I don't say these days, but I think there's one thing that that younger people think may may be more aware of or maybe more sensitive to than their parents or grandparents or etc is that they may be more aware of or more sensitive to how the world has changed you know um and in short you know they they inevitably would have some at least some different perspective on things whether it's their church or culture or whatever else that that may prove useful in reaching younger generations. Um, I, I don't think you can easily overemphasize or over-exaggerate just how significant this is because when y'all used to, when I, I'm sorry, when my parents used to get their news they would get it from usually one of three sources, TV, radio, or newspaper. That's right. One of three sources. I still remember my dad, you know, Sunday morning before church, sitting there reading the newspaper, and I'd always have to, you know, hunt and make sure that I didn't crinkle up the comics section before he got, <laughs> before he got to it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but he would, you know, they would, they would do that now. I I could not I wouldn't have to turn on a I didn't turn on a single news channel whatsoever to learn that a very famous actor slapped a very famous comedian at the Oscars the other night. To truth be told, I didn't even know the Oscars were on <laughs> until I had seen that. You know? And like I grew up <laughs> I grew up watching Will Smith and Fresh Prince reruns and stuff like that. You know, I just, you know, I saw Independence Day when it came out. Anyway, anyway. Anyway, we we won't comment on whether or not it was staged or what. Yeah, there's there's a thousand directions you could take that. But I, it's hard to overemphasize, and like I get a little bit of it because I, I understand it a little bit just because I I can find I, I'm on some of the social media platforms that some of our uh, teens and you know my 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 nephews are in their mid twenties, low twenties, and uh, mid teens. And my you know my nieces are you know either you know low teens or you know kids. And so the ones that have phones, they're on some apps that they are on some social media sites that I'm not on. And like it, it's just it's terrifying the ease of access that you have to things that. All somebody has to do is just have a catchy statement and maybe a little bit, a little bit of music behind it, and then it's almost as if that is what it, what counts for presenting somebody with something that they think is true. It's like, oh well, this this guy's funny and he made a good point here, so he must have all the answers to world economics. It's like, whoa, hey, <laughs> easy there, man. Now let me ask, <laughs> let me ask this question, and. I, keep in mind that we don't have an hour for you to answer this question. <laughs> what is your biggest complaints? What are your biggest complaints about young people today? 
<laughs> they complain too much. That might be fair. What are your... I, y'all aren't going to hurt my feelings. Go ahead and say it. I'm not going to hurt my feelings. What are your biggest complaints about young people today? Lack of work ethic, sure. Of course, yeah. And again, these are generalizations, right? Yeah, not everybody. The other thing is they've grown up with a horrible education system. Yeah. They know nothing. Mm-hmm. They don't know what a 50 cent piece is. Yeah. They don't know who the first president of the United States is. They know like so little. Yeah, mm-hmm. they, they know so little about so much. Yeah. You know. General, it's, it's just kind of lack of, yeah, so they complain too much, uh, lack of work ethic, uh, maybe just sort of lack general so, like social and historical awareness yeah. of some things. Yeah, that's so fair. Their self-esteem, their self-esteem is better than ever. <laughs> so, so some would lead you to believe, yeah. They don't know that they're a bunch of dummies, and they shouldn't feel bad about that. <laughs> Uh, like I said, we don't have we don't have an hour to answer this question. <laughs> that is fair. I think I, perhaps a perhaps a criticism that is uh, equally leveled at generations throughout time, but I'm as, I'm especially aware of how it just it's with teenagers it it is tough like i i'm only 36 and i am aware that i'm 20 years older which is a lifetime to have to have the kids who are back in the gym right now yeah i get that god ooh yeah we could talk about uh yeah. So here's go ahead, Randall, and then we'll I'll mention some of the things that I that I thought of. A lot of that kind of stuff gets a lot of publicity. Yeah. Yeah, that's a legitimate criticism, perhaps not one that we could level at the young people themselves because they're not the ones that, they're not the ones doing the teaching, but your criticism is your criticism is fair, yeah. I, I, I think that I think that you can make that argument. Yeah. Uh, let me mention some of the things that I've got here. Um, they don't take. So these are what I thought y'all might say. They don't take church attendance seriously. OK. All right. Yeah. OK. They're more shaped by culture than by the church. OK. All right. I'm, I'm, this is one time when I'm sad, where I'm getting a lot of head nods. <laughs> um, here's a big one. They tend to want to change things, especially in the church, without knowing why things are the way they are in the first place. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Sorry, no, 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 no. Yeah, I kind of feel like that. Uh, Tony, bring us home here, and then I'll ask my next question. Oh, oh well, it was just, what do you think their biggest complaints would be about your generations? <laughs> Too stuck in the mud. Don't understand. Do I need to hold up my phone again? <laughs> and, and yet Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. You know, so we, we've all been there. It's just, it's just yeah. Know. There's nothing new under the sun. There's just new ways to access it. Yeah. But they really don't know what they don't know. <laughs> so again, like these are... Let's, let's, let's keep... Let's uh, let's keep the uh, let me let's continue on with this train of thought here. Like I said, we could we could spend all night on this. Um, 
What so what do you think their biggest complaints might be about your generations? Randall put it very eloquently, stick in the mud. <laughs> Although to a three year old, that's actually pretty fun. I don't know. Um, res what do you think that do you think that people my age and younger would feel this way about you? That that uh, older generations are often perceived to be resistant to change. Yeah. Okay. Well, see, that's the thing. It's so funny to hear here. Uh, like, I, I finally get it. Uh, and it was about 10 years ago. I was in a Bible class and, and one of my teachers um, was saying, you know, we we wrote and, and he was only like he, he's Mark's age, Mark Adams. age. So they were uh, classmates at uh, Harding. And so he's four, in his early 40s, and he's like, you know, we younger people, we roast older people all the time about how they don't like change. Okay, how would you like it if somebody took your car keys and said, sorry, you don't get to drive anymore? <laughs> oh, suddenly I have a problem with change. Okay, yeah, you don't like change either. You just think you, can, you, just think you do. Yeah. Resistant to change. Here's one that, again, this is, this is not me trying to get anybody in here. I was trying to anticipate the kinds of things that y'all might say, but here's one I, I think might might have a little punch to it. And if it hurts, that's not my intention, but maybe maybe it's convicting. Younger people perceive older people, often perceive older people, as being unwilling to listen or to have conversations about why something may need to be changed. May need to be changed. Why something may need to be changed. And again, that's not me saying, hey, y'all are this way. But I am aware that often that is the perception that younger people have of older people. Yes, sir. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My child is great. Right. Yeah. I don't have a problem with, you know, no, I got, you know, but, but in general, yeah. you know, but I think, I think my, my, I look at my kids' friends, right? Yeah. They're great, great, loving kids. You know, they go to hard hang up there. And yeah. I see a lot of great young men, you know, young ladies and, and I, you, you can, you can keep complimenting my alma mater. I am fine with that. Uh, for those of you who aren't streaming, go to harding.edu and. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Tony, you're right. There's uh, looking at your kids' friends. Gener you, you would see them as generally respectable, right? Yeah. Sure. Because I, I, I wasn't where my son is now. Yeah. And his mindset when I was in Yeah, I, based on those stories you told me at lunch at one day, absolutely. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of things we expect from them that yeah. we were their age, we were probably not doing as well as they were. Sure, right. yeah. You know, I, I look at Joshua, Caleb, I look at you know, Samuel, David, Jesus, and the Lord. <laughs> they yeah. were all young people that you can learn from, right? There's... There. Oh same. goodness! Yeah, back. back. Yeah. There's there's definitely room. But one one thing that I've I've learned, uh, kind of a personal example. Um, I, there was a, there was a kid in my youth group who was a couple of years younger than me. And, um, he was, he was one of the more popular kids. <coughs> he was one of the more popular kids, uh, very well liked. And, uh, I worked a summer job with him and I knew what he talked like and I knew what he talked about. And I just didn't think that he was uh, cut out to be a counselor at our church camp. I didn't think that he was a spiritual leader. And I, I saw him at camp, and he actually did a pretty good job. He did a pretty good job. 
And I was, I was pleasantly surprised. And then I, as I got older and got out of high school and got into college, and I, I started having younger friends who reminded me of him, and I knew them better, I thought, oh, I'm willing to give these guys a little bit more grace because I know them better. I wonder if maybe I had missed an opportunity to give this other kid some grace. Maybe. Maybe. <clears throat> I'm just coming back to that. At that age, though, a lot of times um, the people's peers can um, they can see through something if it's uh, an act or if they're if they are yeah. being uh, insincere. You know, because a lot of people, well, just as far as I worked 12 years at Oklahoma Christian as a hall director. Mm -hmm. And you said that Harvey was a utopia. And everyone thinks that a Christian college is a <laughs> yeah. But I saw well, how the kids a, a microcosm of everything in the world right. was there at Oklahoma Christian. I mean, we had people who stole things. We had people who set fires that were, were arsonists. And I mean, yeah. it, was, it was bad. But, you know, and so there was a, a kind of thing that you, I think that people in, the, in peer groups can see whether you're phony or not. But there's also a time at, in, at that age to grow out of that and to uh, mature. And when we, hopefully we will, they'll grow to be good citizens. And but also, uh, hold them accountable. Very much so. Uh, so for, for y'all who are streaming, uh, Cheryl was arguing about the, the value of grace and the value also of you know, not being afraid to hold people to higher standards. Yeah. Absolutely. The last couple of things that I have here, it it might be it might be a little controversial. I'm just gonna lay it out there for you. I think y'all know by now, like I'm not the kind of person that is just looking for a fight, right? Like I I, I won't back down from a fight, but I, I I'm not I'm not out here ready to just roast anybody. I've been very careful about how I've worded my language tonight. Okay. Now, this isn't necessarily an issue of age, but I think this is, I, I've seen this because I've been in Christian graduate schools and Christian universities and graduate schools from 2004 to 2020. So that's that's been a long time for me to be in private Christian education. Um, you know, 10 years, 10 10 years within Harding's system, and then six years at Asbury, which is not affiliated with Churches of Christ, but at a lot of church traditions come in there. Several folks from Churches of Christ, several folks from independent Christian churches, which are our theological cousins from the uh, Stone Camel movement, and then anybody, every other group under the sun. <clears throat> and I've, I've seen this play out a lot in those circles. I think... A lot of times, and again, these are generalizations, all right? So if you can think of an exception to this, absolutely, yeah, there are exceptions. But I think Christians today often fall into two camps. These are generalizations. There's the personal holiness camp, and there's what I like to call the outreach holiness camp. And I'll explain what I mean by those. The personal holiness camp tend to emphasize things like interpersonal evangelism. You meet somebody, you start up a Bible study with them, and so on. You bring them to church. You do things that are typically identified as being moral, like not having any vices. For example, <laughs> you choose not to drink or smoke or gamble. Or, and I can go on down the line here. <laughs> I actually had a chance to say that in class the other day in my Sunday morning class. You don't drink, smoke, dance, or chew, and you don't date women who do. Uh, I, I, I think Richard and Manette were the only people who appreciated that in class. Uh, you don't use bad language. Crickets around here. You don't watch certain kinds of movies. On the flip side, within the people who generally find themselves drawn towards personal holiness, you may not have as strong a drive or motivation for 
or perhaps even see the need for working on transforming social or government systems or institutions that may be flawed in some way, which unfairly disadvantage some people. These Christians, again, this personal holiness group, these kinds of Christians often see the point of their faith as getting to heaven. We even sing a song about that, right? When we all get to heaven, yeah, what a day that'll be. These Christians often see the point of their faith as getting to heaven with often, not always, but often much less emphasis on healing the world in the here and now. That's one camp. The outreach holiness camp. These are my terms. They tend to emphasize doing things which are often referred to by a term that you will either love or hate. And don't shoot the messenger. Social justice. <laughs> well, I just said, again, has a very positive connotation and a very negative connotation, depending on how you have often heard the term social justice. But it's things like, it could be things like, helping the poor or disabled or other marginalized people groups. People in the outreach holiness group tend to downplay concerns of personal holiness and traditional forms of purity. And I saw I saw these at uh, Asbury quite a bit. There's one guy I know is very dedicated to helping the form and helping the poor and trying to reform the system. I never got into the specifics of what that was, but I, he was very into reforming the system and would use, uh, you know, would use language sometimes that would uh, make a sailor blush. Anyway, okay, so Christians in this group tend to have a strong drive or motivation to transform systems or institutions that may be flawed in some way, which unfairly disadvantage some people. These Christians tend to see the point of their faith as healing the world in the here and now with much less emphasis on getting to heaven. Do these, I'm not asking you if you agree with this, but do these make sense to you? Have you heard of this kind of stuff before? Very much depends on your assumptions, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Who knew, right? I may be a balance between two. We're going to get there here in just a second. <clears throat> I'm going to use two terms that you have almost certainly heard, and you might have a strong aversion to, or you might really appreciate these terms. Okay, again, don't shoot the messenger. The first group tends to be referred to as conservative Christians, <laughs> or you might hear the term evangelical. There's some degree of fundamentalist in that too, yeah. The other group, the outreach group, you might have heard the term progressive. <laughs> Maybe you've heard the term <laughs> liberal. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, depending on the context, <clears throat> liberal conservative can mean totally different things. Anyway, we're not going to get into all that. Here's the thing, though. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. An overemphasis on one personal holiness or outreach, an overemphasis on one or the other to the neglect of the other often leads Christians in the doubt or deconstruction phase. I told you we're going to get there. We're always going to get to that point, overcoming these <laughs> doubt or deconstruction. An overemphasis of one or the other to the neglect of the other often leads Christians in the doubt or deconstruction phase to question the legitimacy of their faith. They are absolutely right. They should be asking the question, wait a second, can't, can't I do both? Can't I do both? Here's a tough example, but it is absolutely true. Yes, I as a Christian should absolutely be willing to affirm historic, orthodox views on human sexuality and how God designed marriage 
I should have no problem being able to affirm that. While at the same time, if I have a brother or sister in Christ who also affirms that, but just for whatever reason can't help but feel attracted to a person of the same sex, but they don't know anything about it, can't, can't I respect them? Can I love them even if I could personally don't experience that? Now, I worded what I said very carefully. A brother or sister in Christ who chooses to remain celibate because despite what they know, they just, for whatever reason, can't help but experience same-sex attraction. I have worded that incredibly carefully on purpose. I should be able to affirm both loving this person while also affirming, yeah, God has envisioned marriage between a man and a woman. And that is God's vision for marriage. And that is his, not just his vision for marriage interpersonally, but the metaphor that he uses for Christ in the church. Randall, we got two minutes left. Can it be quick? Father and mother, yeah. Which was the understanding of how Perfectly fair, yeah. Father and yeah, father and mother, right, was the yeah. Mm-hmm. The fact that you're you have a desire to consume an overwhelming desire to consume alcoholic beverages, if you're resisting that uh, and and not actually drinking alcohol, you know, that's that is something to be celebrated. Very much so. Yeah. The, the the temptation is great, and yet you're resisting the temptation. Yeah. So congratulations to those that are, are able to resist that temptation. Yeah. And don't think that God put that desire in them, which means it's okay. That's that's a good quick comment there. Um, here near the end of this, the um, yeah, comparing whether it's you know one way to describe these kinds of uh, desires that one might have that if they were enacted on, if they were acted upon, would be uh, would be God would dishonor God. One way to describe them are called disordered desires. You have a desire for something that ultimately is self-destructive or destroys the image of God or something along those lines. Resisting that temptation successfully, as difficult as it may be, and you know, again, goodness, we all we all sin, we all fall short of God's glory. But the 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 constant drive to embrace God's mercy and the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome that temptation. Yeah, very much so. Very worth being uh, celebrated. I'm going to mention this here at the end. And again, like I, I hate to, I hate to drop a, a bomb on us at the end and then just say, "Peace, y'all. <laughs> Go in peace. Be warm and be filled." Right? Yeah. But um, <clears throat> I, I am very careful not to give any kind of clue about where I stand on things. You know, politically and stuff like that, because as as a really a, as an authority in our church, I I just don't want people to to know and to think, well, how can he say that? Because he voted for or didn't vote for whatever. So, if you want to ask afterwards, I'm generally along the lines of, you know, like, don't take my stuff and leave me alone and. <laughs> I'm not going to hurt anybody else. Okay, like that's that's generally kind of where where it is. But I I saw this happen too much. I saw I saw in in 2008 and in 2016. All right, think election years. Okay, think election years. I saw Christians be excited about and absolutely hate the two candidates that won in 2008 and 2016. And 
from a historic Christian perspective, I think you can make arguments that both of those gentlemen were not up to the level of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Is that fair? I'm absolutely going to set that standard because Jesus himself set that standard, yeah. And, and I saw some people look to their friends across the aisle and say, well, he's, he stands for such and such. How can, you, how can you as a Christian, and on the other aisle say, well, he's done such and such. How can you think? And for the person who is in the throes of doubt and deconstruction and overemphasis on one small aspect of your faith or the other small aspect of your faith without fully doing both personal holiness and also bringing forth the gospel in such a way that lives are legitimately changed. It's, a, it's very easy for people in that kind of tough situation to look around and say, well, how can you miss something so obvious about this person's moral failings or about what these policies stand for, or stuff like that? How can you miss that? I'm done with it all. And that, that happened to friends of mine. It happened to friends of mine. And it's ugly. And I think we as a church can definitely do better. And it might take some more uncomfortable conversations. But if we can do them with mutual love and listening and not telling people things like, I'm going to discipline you with scorpions like Rehoboam did. <laughs> I think we can help those brothers and sisters get to a point where they don't feel outcast anymore. The gospel calls us to follow Jesus' example of modeling both personal holiness and doing things that in God's name, that's the key, right? God doesn't just call us to be humanitarians. Doing things in God's name that heal the brokenness of the people around us and the world we live in. So. Paul said, come all things to all men. Come all things to all men. That he's violating the Christian principles, but he made himself accept, he, he made we can mix with this bunch and this bunch. Yep. Yep. Paul was willing to sometimes set aside his own personal preferences to be willing to 